up to seven meetings to deliver a user story. I want you to let that sink in. This is not agile. Last year, we had a great conversation with Sumit Moge, the creator of the Async First Playbook, and it was a really nice, informative webinar that I figured, hey, why not share here with you today? The Async First Playbook is fantastic as a resource for you to have if you work in a remote or distributed team, even if you're not the team coach. And I will tell you, not only as a coach, but having spent more than half of my experience as a software developer, being part of one of such teams, it is not the same when we talk about performance for co-located teams, in-person teams versus anything that we call distributed hybrid remote. If you don't want to miss any of our completely free webinars and other resources that I'm always giving away, you just need to join our Agile Circle. It's free. I'll have the link in the information down below. And I will also put the link for the book of uh, Sumit Mogi, the Async Playbook. I am not affiliated, but I really love the material and I really appreciate Sumit and the work that he's doing. So link also in the description down below. And now without further ado, let's jump into the webinar. Enjoy. So my message today is very simple. I've got three plus three things to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about three forces for change that we're all noticing. And I'm pretty sure you'll see some resonance there. And I then want to follow that up with three ideas all of us can lead with. And by the way, my idea of leadership is not the hand wavy leadership. It's more the hands on leadership, right? So what do you what do you do in teams to help them move forward? So let's first get into the three forces for change. All right. And I'd love to hear from you. If this is stuff that you are seeing. So first force for change is what Cal Newport calls the hyperactive hive mind. And I like to call it the collaboration curse. So I'm going to put two images up on the screen. All right. And I want you to tell me in the chat, you can type and tell me which photo signifies collaboration. So you can type photo one, photo two, and I'd like to see what you think. Yeah, so just put it on the chat. Don't be shy. Right, photo one, both, not enough info, photo one, yeah. one or two, one or two. Uh -huh. I see. So, 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 so some, some people are ahead of the game. Some people say photo one. Uh, and if there is ambiguity about this, go ahead, go to any stock image website, right? And type in the words collaboration. And what you will notice is that all pictures have people sitting in an office and, you know, they're, they're all having high, a good time. They're high-fiving each other. They've got hands on hands, that kind of stuff, right? And if you look for images of remote work, you will see people sitting solo most of the time or maybe with family. And it gives rise to this impression that remote work is not collaborative and collaboration is always in person and it's in meetings, it's a modern day unspoken myth amongst people who haven't unraveled remote work as much as probably some of you have. But I think we all will agree that collaboration is not just in person. Dividing and conquering a problem is also collaboration, right? Now, the problem with the myth is that it starts to percolate into our work life. So all of us have some understanding of agile. We work on agile teams. And I've had the good fortune of working with two of the authors of the Agile Manifesto. They are colleagues at ThoughtWorks. So Martin Fowler, Jim Highsmith, they both worked at ThoughtWorks. Martin Fowler continues to work. Jim just re recently retired. Now, the Agile Manifesto has one line which has become problematic in recent years, which is this line. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information in a team is face-to-face -face conversation. Now, you need to understand this was written at a very different time. It was written in 2001, with, where people had big stacks of documentation and they would throw it over the fence to each other. And in that context, it made sense. But what's happened is we've now interpreted this sentence and taken it into a hyper-distributed world. And what that results in is what we call M&Ms, not the nice ones. Uh, these are meetings and managers. So, so the not nice M&Ms. And the problem, the big force for change is the fact that if you actually start inspecting certain teams' processes, you will see that they have up to seven meetings 
to deliver a user story. I want you to let that sink in. This is not agile. If you have to have seven meetings to deliver a user story, and by the way, this is par for the course on many teams. Just go and examine how many meetings the user story goes through. It'll, seven is the average. Okay. So that's, that's the first problem, which is this hyperactive hive mind that we live in. So let's talk about the second problem. The, the second problem is what a lot of people are calling the great return. So there was the great resignation, there was quiet quitting, the great re renegotiation, and now there's the great return. And I like to think of it also as the great divide. And I'll tell you why. A lot of you have seen all of these pieces of news see on your screen right now. Execs asking their people to come back to the office. That's one part of the reality. The other part of the reality is what's reflected on our poll. 80% of technologists want to work remotely most of the time, three days or more each week. All right. Uh, this group might be a little different, but this is my research from a sample of approximately 2000 technologists. Okay. Now, before the pandemic, all of us used to work in the office, right? And then during the pandemic, all of us went and started working from home. So if you notice, when I say all of us, I mean most of us, right? Some of us didn't have uh, exactly that homogeneous experience, but most of us were in a very homogeneous setup, right? Everyone's in the office, everyone's at home. What's happening now with this great divide is you have some people working in an office, some people working at home. And by the way, even when I say office, there are two kinds of offices. So there's your office, uh, I, I can't write your office. Sometimes in my case, because I'm a consultant, there's the client office, right? So then that adds one more environment, like a third place. So this is a bit of an unprecedented distribution challenge. People are throwing out the word hybrid and nobody quite knows what that word means. People feel like, oh, it's the best of both worlds, but it is the most difficult thing to do. Now throw into the mix something that we've gotten used to over the last two or three years of the pandemic. Just so you know where I live, uh, this is where I sit in India. It's a city called Pune. That's where I'm doing this call from. And my colleagues are all across the world. All right. Now, I did some research last year just with my colleagues in India because you'll say, oh, okay, you're, you're showing me the entire world, Sumit. So uh, I can create a map like that as well. I want to show you where all of my Indian colleagues are. Okay, so these are just the locations that we have, the official locations we have in India. But when I did my research last year, this is just my colleagues. This is what the map looks like. I'm going to zoom that map in. India is a big country. This is how spread out people are in that country. So in relation to each other, regardless of whether we have hybrid, remote, or one some mix of or the other, we are all going to be remote and we are all going to be distributed. That's just a reality of our life, right? And that's a big force for change. Now, I want to add a sobering statistic because this obviously is feeling like a tussle between the employers and the employees, right? And I'd like to leave you with a bit of a provocation for you to think about where is this headed? So the International Monetary Fund, which does a lot of research around economics, says that there's going to be a shortage of 85 million tech workers in the next seven years. Now, that number's big. Sometimes big numbers don't make sense. That number, because Petula is in Canada, I thought, let's contextualize it. That's twice the population of Canada and some, because Canada is, what, 38 million? So this is twice the population of Canada and some. Now, that's going to result, that shortage of tech talent is going to result in annual revenue losses of $8.3 trillion. Again, big number. So let's contextualize this. That's the GDP of Germany, the United Kingdom, and Spain put together. So I want you to think if there's a shortage of tech talent and there's money on the table that companies can't earn, who's going to win this great return, the great divide, the great renegotiation. So that's a provocation. And that's my second force for change. My third force for change, which is what's taken the world by storm over the last three months, 
is the AI revolution. So is it a super threat? Is it a super power? I want to show you two examples and then one more. So tab nine, which is what you see up here, that's a piece of software. You just give it a piece of text and it does and generates code for you. So that's the developer's job. And Galileo, which is the screen which you see in front, you give it a little bit of text and it generates the screen for you. So you've got a designer's job and a developer's job, augmented at least by AI. Now, that's not all. We actually have tools where you can give the tool a description, some entities, and you can generate not just the front end, but also the back end. So in that situation, we've got to ask ourselves the question of, is it us versus AI? Or is it us and AI? And that's the third force for change that I'd like you to think about. So, so let's keep those three forces for change on the side for a minute. And I'd like to propose that another world is possible. And one, one tool for us to navigate this world of uncertainty is what I call an async first way of working. I'm, I don't claim to be the inventor of this term. I just happen to be writing a book about it. There are others who've used this term in the past. Now, just to explain, what does that term mean? Async first means meetings are not the first option. They are the last resort. Because do remember, it's very easy to click a button and invite 10 people to a meeting. That takes almost zero effort. But once you start looking at the cost of that meeting, which is whatever the billing rate of those individuals is, et cetera, et cetera, that starts to become a very costly exercise if you don't do it well. And we've seen that people spend up to a day and a half on average every week in meetings, which is just too much. Uh, every, well, let's not get into how many, how many dollars that is. It's a very big number. Let's just say that's a very big number in terms of productivity. So meetings are the last resort, not the first option. But if that is the case, it has two associated principles. If meetings are the last resort, then writing becomes a primary means of communication. But we can't write as fast as we talk, right? So then you've got to be comfortable with some lag in communication. And that's okay because everything isn't urgent. You give people the time to think, absorb stuff, get back to you, and it'll be fine. Everything doesn't have to be addressed just this instant. So um, I, I have a framework for you to think through which meetings you need and which meetings you don't need. And I'll share that with you in a few moments. Thank you okay. so much, Sumi. Yeah, let, let's get going. Cool. So we talked about the three forces for change. Don't kill your back. Use a standing desk. Of course, of course. Yeah, I, I don't have a standing desk. I have a pile of books on the side. Uh, if I ever was in that kind of a standing meeting, I just stack it up. How do we convince senior management? Let's come to that maybe towards the end because, you know, some of these things are always not just our sphere of influence. We've got to talk to other people, but there are some ideas I can I can share with you in terms of convincing senior management and getting them on board. Okay, so we talked about the three forces for change. And then now it's time to talk about the three ideas you can lead with. So first things first, we talked about collaboration and the hyperactive hive mind, right? And I'd like you to reimagine collaboration beyond what stock photos tell us, right? Uh, so first things first, if you are leading an agile team that is remote, define your workflow. And when I say define your workflow, I want you to, to take some time to say, all right, what are the different stages that work passes through? And how many pieces of work can be in every stage? The reason this is important because is because if you don't define your workflow, everyone is still imagining your workflow, right? And when everyone is imagining your workflow, that's when you have the hyperactive hive mind because everyone is trying to reimagine what the process is going to be for every single task. And you have what we see as the meeting madness. For example, I just recently started working on a team and we, we wrote up a document of how we deliver in this group. So our workflow is represented in this little flowchart. And 
We use Trello to track our work. We've even described in our team how we will use Trello to follow the process that we've lined up. So this, this whole thing breaks up into multiple little screenshots and demos that people can see. And this is also an onboarding artifact for anyone who joins the team so that they know exactly how to use Trello when they work on this team. So that's number one, just ensure that you define your workflow. It'll create immense clarity on your distributed team. The second thing when it comes to reimagining collaboration is speeding up decisions. So let me tell you this. If you had two teams, everything is the same. And there's a team that makes 50 decisions of which 10 are bad. And there is one team that makes five perfect decisions. It's the team that makes more decisions that will make more progress. It's just a mathematical statistical fact, right? And those 10 bad decisions in software are usually reversible. So the cost of getting it wrong is often very, very low unless you're taking a decision that is related to the core of the business. Everything from a feature toggle to a canary release, you have loads and loads of options to roll back mistakes. So you need to optimize for fast decisions. And we need to get to this point where we understand that collaboration is not consensus. So I'll tell you what happens on many agile teams. We say, oh, collaboration is good. Everyone needs to collaborate on everything. And so we get into this whole, how many engineers does it take to screw in a light bulb situation where everyone is getting to a whiteboard, whether online or physical, to solve a simple problem like, how do I write this class? And I say that you need to decentralize. So instead of this model, which is a very chaotic model, try to structure your team into smaller pods. And those pods can be short-lived. You can align them to a feature or a problem that you're trying to solve. And you decentralize the decisions to those pods. So for that particular feature, it's the pod that makes the decision. And if you need a tie break, you don't need the entire team to get together. You nominate somebody who's a directly responsible individual, a DRI, who will then make decisions and help the team go ahead. So if there's a tie, they break the tie. Now, I want to show you something which I hope will make you make sense. The DRIs can be stable counterparts to each other, right? And that can help the pods stay connected with each other if you are concerned about losing cohesion in the team, right? So that's the decentralized decision-making model. And that kind of rounds off the first idea that I wanted to have you lead with, which is reimagine how you collaborate. The second set of ideas is about designing your process to be distributed by default. Now, one of the things that a lot of us do is we imagine how we used to do something in the office and then we recreate the office in the cloud using things like Zoom and Slack and all of that stuff. What that results in is a very interrupted environment. If you've got to work in a remote and distributed fashion, you have to embrace documentation. I know the Agile Manifesto says that working software is more important than comprehensive documentation, but that does not mean that we do not need documentation. In fact, Martin Fowler said this in 2005. This is from a 2005 essay on offshore development. He said, documentation becomes very important when you have multiple locations in place, right? So what should you document? I have a few ideas for you and you can take away the mnemonic deep. So if you have a decision, you document it. If there is an event like a meeting, you should document it with proper meeting notes. Because if you don't do that, Everyone will want to be in every meeting because there's fear of missing out, right? Oh, nobody's going to tell me, so I'm going to attend every meeting. And before you know it, everyone's got, what, 20 hours of meeting in a week, right? If you've got to explain something, go ahead and document it. You can document it using a video. For example, this thing of me not doing the same talk twice. I've got the explanation in place. I save myself the trouble by recording it. And I give myself the chance of doing a new talk 
because the old talk is already recorded. But what this also gives you is the power to respond with a link as against having a meeting for every single explanation, right? And then proposals. The reason I bring proposals into this is because ideas, when they're fresh, are generally fragile. So it helps that somebody takes the time to outline them properly and others take the time to handle them with care and to give considered feedback. So any of these decisions, events, explanations, proposals, be sure to write them up or document them in another format through video or audio. And you'll find that it'll create clarity on your distributed team in a big way. So again, going back to my most recent team, we have one team hub, uh, which you can see on the screen, which catalogs all of our information about the team. And again, it also serves as an onboarding artifact. If anyone wanted to join, they wanted to know, oh, how do we work? They go to our ways of working. Oh, what programs are we running? They can look at that. Who's on the team? They can look at that. How do I communicate in this team? They can look at that. So they've got all of that information available to them. Right. And then stop the meeting madness. Uh, we don't need 14 hours of meetings every week. I, I think we can all agree on that. It's the number one cause of burnouts on distributed teams. Uh, this is this is not my data. It is industry data, which I've verified. And we've all been in that meeting that could have been an email, right? So we don't want to be in those meetings. So how do you decide whether a meeting is necessary or not necessary? I've got a simple framework for you, which I promised I will share with you, right? Think about it on one axis. On one end, you have convergence, which is you need to get to some sort of agreement. On the other end of the spectrum, you have conveyance, which is I just need to convey an idea. I just need to tell somebody something, right? So that's the X axis. And then you have the Y axis. Right on top, you have, a, have people with whom you have a strong relationship. Right at the bottom, you have people with whom your relationship isn't that strong, a weak relationship. So now let's start looking at quadrant by quadrant. So quadrant number one, people with whom you have a strong relationship and you just want to convey information. Don't do a meeting. You can go async with this. Just send them a document, write them an email, send them a message. It's very easy, right? It's very unlikely they will misunderstand you and conveying written information is a lot easier. I'm not saying you should never get in touch with them. I'm saying to convey information, don't, right? Now let's look at the next quadrant. You want to convey information to somebody you have a weak relationship with. In this case, of course, async is good to convey information, but you would probably want to build the relationship and gradually move async. So use the whole act of conveyance as a way to build the relationship, right? This could be a client who you're trying to start working with, right? In that case, build that relationship by sharing the information with them. What about when you're trying to converge, agree on something with somebody you have a weak relationship with? No brainer. You definitely need a meeting in these kind of circumstances because written communication doesn't convey, com convey emotion in these kind of states, right? So feel free to go ahead with synchronous communication meetings in these scenarios. And then what if you have a strong relationship and you're trying to agree on things? This is where I say start async first which is write a document, share it with everyone, get people's inputs. And then only when you need to make a decision on all of the information you've collected, get into a meeting. So prepare async, synthesize inputs, and then go sync. So uh, this is what I call the Converell quadrants because convergence, conveyance, and then the relationships. So uh, this might help you decide whether you really need that stand-up meeting, right? Uh, which is the question that Rupa asked. All right, so that's the second, which is distributed by design, distributed by default. The third thing, which is addressing that force, which is AI, is prioritizing deep work. Because in an age of AI, the only superpower that a human being has is that we can work deeply on problems that AI is not equipped to handle yet right? Yet. I, I make the point yet because I don't know what's going to happen in a month's time. So I want you to think about the human machine partnership in a different way. 
Humans are still better equipped to think about design, story, symphony, empathy, meaning, play, all of these together than machines are. So I like to think that humans in the next several months are going to be more outcome focused, which is to say, how do I solve a problem? And then machines can help us get to that solution much faster and they can have that output focus, right? So what does that mean? It means that code monkeys are less valuable than people who can train models. And they, in turn, are less valuable than people who can solve problems creatively. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that solving problem creatively requires deep thought, heads down work. So you need to give yourself and others the gift time. Now, the easy way of doing this is to work with your team. And if your calendar, if your team's calendar looks like this, which is a very fragmented calendar, try to move all meetings to one half of the day and make one half of the day meeting free. I've tried this with many teams. It's one of the easiest things you can do. And people usually appreciate it when you can give them one half of the day to just focus on whatever they do, whether it's design, coding, writing requirements, whatever it might be, right? One step further, you can go ahead and make one entire day meeting free. And that very easily gives you about 20 odd hours of deep work each week. Trust me, as human beings, we can't handle any more than that. If you can handle that, you're going to have a big productivity jump already, right? The, the hidden trick here is if, if your team calendar starts to look at this, don't start to schedule your appointment with your mentor, an interview, uh, you know, a little uh, other one-to-one -one meeting here. You've got to do all of your meetings in this block, right? Keep these blocks absolutely sacrosanct. Don't touch. Focus on deep work. All right. A another thing that will help with meeting, uh, will, will help with deep work, sorry, is an approach that I call VUCA. And that is just a write first, talk later approach. I'm not saying don't talk. I'm saying write first. And I say this also because I don't speak English as a first language. All right. You, you'll notice that when people don't speak English as a first language, Sometimes there's always a gap in communication. You're trying to say something, but you can't say it fast enough. Your brain doesn't react fast enough. Uh, the translation engine doesn't work fast enough. So, But then writing, you can do it at your own pace. There are spell checkers. There are writing tools that can help you construct your thoughts in a better fashion. So you are able to slow down. And slowing down is a good thing when it comes to deep thoughts, right? So how do you unravel complexity? Let's say you have a proposal, write it up first. Once you've written it up, others need to take the time to understand it. Once they've understood it, then it's time for them to critique it, give you feedback. And also you've got to respond to that critique, right? And once that whole process of giving and receiving feedback is done, you can agree on whatever's the decision, right? And it seems like, oh, it's a very big process. It isn't. You can get to decisions much quicker than everyone pulling ideas out of their hats in a meeting. If everyone's consumed the same information, you will realize that getting to a decision in a meeting is much faster. And by the way, this is an iterative process. You go through it over and over and over again.